I am very pleased to introduce our guest this evening, Dr. Larry Summers. Larry's list of accomplishments and positions that he's held is incredibly impressive. I don't think I need to tell anybody that. So I'm going to share just a snapshot. Larry is currently the Charles W. Eliot University professor and president emeritus of Harvard University, as well as wild director of the Mosavar Rahman Center for Business and Government at Harvard's Kennedy School. He served in numerous senior policy positions in Washington, D.C., including the 71st Secretary of the Treasury for President Clinton, Director of the National Economic Council for President Obama, and Vice President of Development Economics and Chief Economist of the World Bank. He received his bachelor's degree from MIT and his PhD from Harvard and has received numerous accolades and recognition for his work, including the Alan T. Waterman Award of the National Science Foundation and the John Bates Clark Medal Offer Medal. So I met Larry for the first time um, when he became president uh, of Harvard University. And when I think about that time, what I remember about Larry is his uncanny ability to identify the key issues at Harvard University. And those two key issues which he worked on and elevated were making Harvard University wonderful for undergraduates instead of focusing only on the professional schools. And he also recognized that science was the frontier, the new frontier, and that Harvard University needed to step up his game to make sure that we were on the forefront in science. The other comment I'll make is that since the crash, Larry's been pretty much right about every prediction he's made about the economy. So we'll see what he has to say <laughs> tonight. So, Larry, let me start by um, asking you a, a somewhat personal question, because many of us in the room, me included, um, have had either experienced cancer ourselves or have had our loved ones go through cancer. And I think we would all be very interested in hearing about your personal experience with cancer, if you don't mind sharing some of your story with us. Let me first say, Laurie, how uh, glad I am uh, to be here and how much I admire uh, you from the time we worked together while I was president of Harvard and how much I've admired the Dana-Farber over uh, many years. Uh, I have known many people who have been treated at uh, the Dana-Farber and once every several months I encounter some situation with someone who's been re recently diagnosed and I contact you or someone else at the Dana-Farber and without exception, the care is terrific scientifically, not, to be honest, that I would really know if it wasn't. But what I would know is if the human values embodied in the care were not extraordinary, and they are. And the ability, and the ability to combine cutting edge science with first-rate treatment of the patient as well as the disease is something that is quite extraordinary. And the physicians at the Farber, if I might be so presumptuous, should be enormously proud of uh, the work that they do. And I know that uh, this is important. 32 years ago now, 33 years, 33 years ago now, I was a young, I guess you'd say, hotshot economist who'd recently become a tenured professor at uh, Harvard. I thought I was conquering uh, uh, the world and thought of myself as roughly immortal. 
I all of a sudden felt, uh, I all of a sudden uh, felt uh, sick. I had a chronic fever for some time. I felt uh, very weak. I probably didn't go to the doctor as rapidly as I should have because I was a 29-year-old wise guy. Eventually, I got myself to uh, the right uh, doctor, um, and I was told that I needed to go see a hematologist, and I wasn't at the time smart enough to have any clue of what that might uh, mean. I saw the hematologist, and I was told that um, my girlfriend would be going home to pack my bag because I would be going uh, to the hospital because I was very seriously ill. I was diagnosed with uh, stage 4B, which is, I think, the last stage there is, um, Hodgkin's uh, disease. Um, it had spread, it had spread uh, all over. I was lucky. I was lucky in two respects. I, in several respects. I was lucky mostly that just 10 years before, not 25 years before, 10 years before, the chemotherapy regime that I was administered had been developed, and in fact had been developed here in uh, Boston. And so there was a regime of chemotherapy. It was a lousy, but not ultimately excruciating experience. And I went into remission. And lucky for me, because the odds on that proposition at the time were about 50%. Um, I went into remission, and I haven't had any kind of cancer recurrence in the intervening 32 years. And I learned a few things from that experience. I learned the incredible importance of the kind of medical research that is done at institutions like this. I learned the Im incredible importance of quality medical care. When I was president of Harvard, I used to meet from time to time with medical students or residents. And I would tell them about the session where my doctor and the fellow and the resident shared with me what the diagnosis was and what the regimen was to be. And I told them that the incredible responsibility of being a physician at an institution like this one was that what was just another hour in your day was going to be the most memorable hour in the persons you were spending it with's life. And that put an awesome responsibility on you. And I was very fortunate in uh, the quality of my physician, Dr. David Rosenthal, who many of you know and who served with great distinction as the head of Harvard's University Health Service, and with uh, the fellow who, on that case, Dr. David Scadden, who has made such a big difference in our community uh, in uh, the stem cell area. So that was the second thing I learned. And the third thing I learned from the experience, and this is something I have fairly frequent occasion uh, to share, probably once every few weeks, um, I hear about someone I, someone I know, or the child of someone I know, or the spouse of someone um, I know, or the friend of a friend, who's recently been diagnosed uh, with cancer. 
and I call them, and I always say the same thing. I don't tell them they're going to get better, because I don't know for sure that they're going to get better. And the worst things people said to me when I was sick were people who didn't, who didn't know what they were talking about told me that it was going to be fine, they were sure. And I didn't want to say, no, you actually don't know what's going on, you're wrong. But it really wasn't much comfort that, my, that, that some friend of mine's cousin who'd had stage one Hodgkin's disease had gotten better. That really didn't do much for me. So I say the same thing to them every time. I say, when I was diagnosed with cancer, for months, for, for weeks, I could not go five minutes without thinking about cancer. And then I couldn't go a full hour without thinking about cancer. And then I couldn't go a full day without thinking about cancer. And I thought my life was going to be defined by cancer. But that, in fact, weeks had gone by, and I had not thought about cancer at all till I heard about their case. And that very likely would happen to them. And I told them, and it almost doesn't always work, but it usually works, usually would be true. I'm a reasonably public figure. I've been covered a reasonable amount in uh, the press. A fair number of people have, a fair amount of exp have had a fair amount of exposure to me. And the vast majority of the time, when I tell them that I had late stage cancer, they had no idea. And that makes the point also that cancer doesn't need to define you and won't define your life. And increasingly with the work you're doing here, it's not gonna end the life or even define the life of the large majority of the people who experience it. And that I think is based on my experience a hugely, hugely important thing. Thank you, Larry. So you were a very strong supporter of biomedical science when you were president at Harvard, and you've continued to be a very strong supporter of the life sciences and biomedical enterprise and community in Boston, which, bar none, is the best in the world. But we are facing tough times, and I would ask you, what are some changes in public policy in the city, level, at the state level, or at the national level do we need to make in order to continue to support and continue to increase the progress that this research can bring? Because I feel that we are under significant threat as a country. So I would just say this. If the 20th century was the century of physics, the 21st century will be the century of the life sciences. And I always think you should look at the big picture. And my way of doing that is to ask when somebody in 2300 writes a history of the beginning of the 21st century, what will they talk about? And I think they'll talk about two things. They'll talk about the rise of Asia and all of that. And they'll talk about the revolutions in the life sciences. So this is an extraordinary moment. And if the 20th century is a century of physics, was about the, atom was about the atomic bomb and uh, the silicon ship and uh, the rocket ship and the internet, this century will be a century about victory against disease, success in limiting pain and suffering, large-scale extension of life and substantial augmentation of human capability. And it's probably going to be the best thing that ever happened to mankind. Wow. And 
Here is the thing. In 1500, the 15th century, Florence was not the biggest city in the world, it was not the richest city in the world, but it was the most important city in the world because what human minds in Florence were doing, what they were doing artistically, what they were doing culturally, what they were doing scientifically with respect to what was most important to human thought at that time. And I would say to you that Boston has exactly that potential right now because if you draw a circle with a six mile radius from right where we are right now, you have more life science talent within that circle by a factor of two than in any comparable six mile circle on this planet and it is the most important thing that's happening for humanity. There is no risk, none, that we will overinvest, overcare, or overdo it with respect to solving these problems. What does that mean? It means that all of us have to worry not about the mistakes we make, but about the things we do not do and the opportunities that we miss. It means that all of us have to be prepared to take risks and bet on young genius. It is a crime, I use that word carefully, it is a crime to note that when Jim Watson discovered the sequence for DNA and changed the world, he was 28 years old. And the average investigator right now, when they get their first grant from the National Institute of Health, is 43 years old. Their first grant. That is a crime. And that means that we, the town of education, have to figure out how to channel resources to new young investigators doing new creative things. I said, I said something in my inaugural address as president of Harvard that I actually considered not saying because I thought it was a bit of a cliche. And then I discovered when I said it that a number of people regarded it as controversial. Well, they were wrong. Here's what I said. I said, we will take risks. We will fail. We will fail many times. Because the greatest failure would be if we never had any failures. Because that would mean that we had not taken the risks that the challenges of the moment demand. And so I would ask all of you who are involved in supporting research, all of you who are allocating research uh, dollars, to make sure that you are taking risk, that you are gambling on the things that could change the world, and recognizing that if there's a 10% chance it will change the world profoundly, it is okay if it fails. Our problem is not going to be too much, too little incremental science. Our problem is going to be too much, too little revolutionary science. I would say two other things. I mean, there are a set of fairly obvious things. We need decent schools and more, and more appropriate housing uh, in uh, this uh, city and a set of things that would strengthen uh, this uh, city. But I'm just gonna highlight three other things. One, we need to demand that whatever else is going on with the budget deficit, whatever else is going on with the crazy politics of our moment, that we not short circuit 
biomedical research funding by the federal government. The NIH is necessary no matter what else happens if we are to meet the challenges of this moment. And in any dialogue that any of us have with anybody in Washington, that needs to be an absolutely central point of our argument. Second uh, thing uh, that I would say, even with all of the what we can reasonably expect the NIH to do, this is a moment where success or failure is going to depend on philanthropy. It's going to be philanthropy that is going to make possible the creation of the next generations of physician scientists who are going to actually succeed in making cancer history. The NIH and the associated bureaucracy are not going to do it alone. The Forbes 400, just the Forbes 400, has $2.5 trillion. The resources of this country that can be dedicated to basic science are enormous. And so we just need to excite a next generation of philanthropists around basic science and the facilities that make it uh, possible in the way that an earlier generation was excited about the opera and the art museum and the great uh, universities. The most important thing that a philanthropist can do is set off a chain that leads to an extraordinary discovery. And I'd say a third thing, and I'm now saying something that everybody who's any kind of academic leader uh, has said in this city for decades, and we're making progress. We need to all be in this together. It doesn't really matter to an antibody whether you're studying it from the perspective of Harvard University, the Massachusetts General Hospital, the Department of Biology, or the Dana-Farber. Really, it doesn't. It doesn't matter to the kids for whom research is the difference between whether they'll get to really know their grandparents or not, whether the funding is coming from the medical school or the school of uh, public health. If we are going to be able to take advantage of the fact that there is twice as much brilliance in this place as in any other, all of the brilliance in this place has to be in interaction with the other brilliance in this place. And it's getting better, but I don't think there's anybody in this room who would say that cooperation across the hospital system or across the partners system, I don't mean the partner system, or across the Harvard uh, system is everything that it could be or should be. And I don't think there's anyone who would say they were fully satisfied, though we've come a long way, with the progress we've been able to make in using connection with commercial entities 
to accelerate the movement from scientific discovery to actual uh, cure at the bedside. So maybe I've given a longer answer than you wanted, Lori, but <laughs> I would emphasize, but I care, and I'd emphasize cooperation, private money, public money, and this is the most important thing that's going to happen in any of our lives. So now I'm going to uh, switch gears a little bit and ask you an even bigger question, which is, what do you think of the long-term prosperity of the American economy? Where are we going to be? I told you it was a big question. First of all, even as I've devoted my life to economics, I'm actually not sure that that's as important a question as the question we've been discussing. And I say that uh, in all seriousness. Uh, would I rather see cancer be eliminated over the next 30 years, or would I rather see the growth rate of the economy increased by two-thirds of a percent? I'd rather see cancer eliminated, and I think most of you would as well. Look, uh, it's a kind of, you know, economists are sort of known for on the one hand, on the other hand, glass half full kind of stuff. And it's kind of true. Look, here's the good news. The good news is we've got more brilliant, entrepreneurial, effective people in the United States than any other country in the world has. We have better universities than any other country in uh, the world has. We have entrepreneurs and managers and dynamic companies in the United States that are uh, second, uh, to, uh, second to none. We've got fantastic uh, natural uh, resources and we've got the remarkable feature that we are the only place in the world where more or less wherever you were born and wherever you live, you're thinking about whether you want to move and come to our country. And that can't be said about any other country. And those are huge <laughs> advantages. <laughs> Having said that, <laughs> Our system has brought to power, to a increasing extent, and with a sharp turn a year ago, a dysfunctional government that is squandering our competitive advantages with short-sighted foolishness. Short-sighted foolishness in the form of a truculent isolationism towards the rest of the world. Short-sighted foolishness in an unwillingness to acknowledge and debate issues based on fact, logic, and evidence rather than slogan. Dysfunctional government in the extent of the division and divisiveness and willingness to pit one community, one group against um, another. Dysfunctional government in an inability to come together and take strong measures to solve problems, whether it's the adequate funding of medical research or the fact that we have an air traffic control system in this world, in the United States, that has no contact with three important letters, GPS. Yes, there are vacuum tubes, 
but there's no GPS in the American air traffic control system. I'm gonna fly tonight to Dubai. Dubai's airport makes Kennedy Airport look like something out of the stagecoach uh, era. We talk about the importance of STEM. We do a lot. But when a third of the schools in America can't get the HVAC system working in the chemistry labs so that the students don't get sick, the students are kind of skeptical that STEM is the most important thing in America. I'll never forget, when I was Treasury Secretary, I uh, made it my practice, whenever I visited an American city, to go to a high school and to talk about the importance of education and I would talk about financial education and it was just something I made, a kind of trademark that I would go to an urban school whenever I went to a city. And I went to Oakland, I was in Oakland and I visited a school and I'm not bad at this and so I gave a speech and um, a young teacher, I don't know, she was probably in her high 20s, came up to me afterwards and said, Secretary Summers, that was a good speech. I said, thank you. And she said, but there's just one thing. Why should any of the kids believe you when you say that education is the most important thing in our country? And I said, what do you mean? And she said, the paint isn't chipping off the walls at McDonald's. The paint isn't chipping off the walls at the movie theater. The paint isn't chipping off the walls at Walmart. The paint isn't chipping off the walls at uh, the Marriott. The paint isn't chipping off the walls at my parents' house. But the paint is chipping off the walls in all the classrooms at this school. Why should the kids believe you? And I'm not often lost for words, but I didn't really have a very good answer. And so I guess I would say that I think the prospects are pretty good, but there are very, very big uh, challenges. Ultimately, I'm an optimist, and I think Winston Churchill got it right when he said, America always, always does the right thing, but only after exhausting all the alternatives. <laughs> <laughs> We're exhausting. <laughs> some particularly challenging alternatives <laughs> in Washington right now. So you've said that um, secular stagnation is the economic problem that defines modern times. Talk to us about your secular stagnation hypothesis and how can we overcome secular stagnation? So look, the basic idea is, you know, if you think about it, we're in a sort of funny time. Um, it always used to be through most of our adult lifetimes that the problem was too much inflation. Now it seems like the problem is too little inflation. Can the Fed get to 2%? It always seemed like uh, the problem was we had too much demand and then we were getting this inflation. And now it seems like we have too little uh, demand. Always seemed like the problem was that interest rates were too high so people couldn't borrow to finance houses. Now it seems like interest rates are too low so people can't save for their retirement or earn a decent return on an endowment. How do those things fit together? Well, my idea, which was Alvin Hansen's idea in the 1930s, has been that for a whole variety of reasons, 
we have a huge volume of desired saving. There's more inequality, there's more, and so wealthy people save more, there's more money coming in uh, from China, there's more people who are scared and feel a need to save, more of the money's going in profits, and those tend to get saved. And at the same time, we have a kind of demassification of the economy. People use e-commerce, so there's no need to build malls. Law firms used to need 1,200 square feet of space per lawyer. Now they only need 700 feet of space per lawyer because the cloud means no uh, filing uh, cabinets. And you could go on uh, thinking of uh, examples like that. Our most successful companies, Google, Google and Apple, even though they're doing huge technological things, can't figure out what to do with all their cash. And so when you have a lot of savings and a limited demand for limited investment demand, what happens? You have a strong tendency towards really low interest rates. That's what we see. You have a strong tendency towards uh, lots of savings, limited investment to put it to work. Uh, that means softness in demand, and that means limited inflation. And so that is, I think, our condition. And I think it creates real risks. Things are pretty good right now, but those very low interest rates mean that asset prices are awfully inflated. And it also means that whenever the next recession comes, we've got a playbook for recession. The playbook is that the Fed cuts interest rates by 500 basis points, by five percentage points. Well, guess what? We're not going to be able to call that play when the next, <laughs> when the next recession comes. Um, and we're not going to be able to call it for the obvious reason that the interest rate's going to be 2.5% or 3% or wherever it's 1.5%, wherever it's going to be. It's very unlikely to be anywhere near 5%. So what do we do? I think we've got to figure out how to get people to spend in a more systematic way and particularly to invest. And we've talked about a lot of the ways you can invest. There's no reason why we can't fix the schools. There's no reason why we can't have a real air traffic control system so planes don't have to circle uh, endlessly. You know, when I started, when I started as an economist at Harvard, it took an hour and 15 minutes to fly from Boston to Washington. Today, with 50 years of extra, 40 years of extra technology, it takes um, an hour and 40 minutes to fly from Boston <laughs> uh, to Washington. And that's all about the air traffic control system and congestion and all that. We can fix that. I promise, Lori could put another $400 million to work over the next few years, and if she did, thousands of people who would otherwise die would not die. Secular stagnation is the classic example of John Kennedy's doctrine that man's problems were made by man. It follows that they can be solved by man, although if John Kennedy were saying it today, he would say we're made by men and women, and it follows that they can be solved by, men and by women and men. <laughs> I second that. <laughs>